Cool. Well, we're gonna. Am I going to get started? Try and stay on time and everything. It's about 1:30. Um, I'm Josh Ward. I work for a company called Veloci. We do uh, specialize in doing Drupal SEO. We don't do design, development, or theming. Uh, just SEO. But for us, um, well, uh, let me start with me. Uh, what I do at Veloci, we have a partner program, so we partner with great people like Achieve Internet and, and some of the other companies that are here, uh, and we, we kind of handle, we're their SEO team, right? Um, Y'all will come in and build or integrate or, or theme or whatever it is that you do, and then when your clients say, I've got this great site, now I want people to see it, we kind of step in. And so I manage those partner relationships and uh, do some marketing, and I get to come to just about every Drupal camp I can, so it's pretty, it's a lot of fun. Um, and, and hang out and buy drinks from time to time. Um, but for us, uh, the reason we decided to kind of focus on this, uh, on conversions this year, was um, we, we talk a lot about SEO. We wrote the book on SEO. Uh, and, and I think at least one chapter in here is devoted actually to conversions because driving traffic to sites are, I mean, is one thing. Uh, we, well, I say we. Um, I like to say sometimes that you know we could train monkeys to drive traffic to websites uh, because it's you know it's kind of repetitive. You're doing the same things. It's uh, you know we don't hire people who are SEO savvy. We bring them in and we train them um, to be to be SEO guys. Uh, but conversions is a little bit more um, it's a little more finesse, right? It takes a little bit more uh, intelligence than maybe a monkey would have, and uh, you have to look at data and analytics, and it's uh, it's kind of an ongoing process. And so we thought since this is such a big piece of our process with our clients and our campaigns, why not start talking about that in the Drupal community? Um, so, uh, so Susan asked for my Twitter account, at Josh D. Ward is my Twitter account, so if you have questions now or later, you can find me there, or all my contact information, including my phone number, I think, is on the Veloci site, and, uh, and I'll be around through tomorrow if you want questions or chat or, or whatever later. Um, but I'm going to start with a little story. Uh, uh, I was at lunch today with um, a friend of mine who runs a site called wisebread.com. Uh, you should check it out. It's a very cool site. And he was telling me about, uh, this is, I think, if Google, unless Google lied to me, um, this is a casino in Commerce, California, which is not too far from here. And supposedly poke, or, uh, California is like the poker capital of the world. I didn't know this, but um, I thought that was very cool. And, and so this is supposed to be... Uh, a picture of that, and he was saying, yeah, that the poker rooms in commerce are really nice, um, and that they actually, I don't, the picture was kind of kind of blurry, but like right there, there's a, that's a cart sitting next to his chair, and if, if you get up close to the picture, now that it's, you know, like 50 feet big, there's a cart like behind every chair with food or drinks or whatever on it, and what they're, uh, when he said they, what they do is to keep you at the table, they not only serve you food at your chair, but they serve you amazing food at your chair. So you don't want to get up and, and go to a different restaurant in the casino or whatever it is. Um, you just, you stay there and you spend money uh, and you play poker and you, you have a really good time. And, um, and I thought, what a great analogy to what I'm about to talk about, right? Because conversions, uh, a lot of times, are getting people to stay on your website and do what you want them to do. And, and the casino is doing exactly that. They want you to come sit down at the poker tables and spend money and gamble because they know eventually you will lose and you'll put money in their pockets, right? And so we don't necessarily want to be mean or trick people, but we kind of want to do this exact same thing, right? We want, to, we want to feed them whatever it is that they want and we want it to be good stuff so that they stay on our sites and, and they, they do something that's going to benefit our business. Um, so I totally stole that for him. So um, <clears throat> I want to talk about, uh, before we kind of dig into the... Uh, uh, the nuts and bolts here is uh, kind of a, a utopian or a fantasy world versus reality. Um, and, and what, uh, from a conversion standpoint, and, and probably a lot of you would like to see uh, in the projects that, that you're involved in versus what actually happens, right? So, so if, let's play the what if game here for a second. And let's say, um, what if CEOs understood web design, right? What if the guy at the top who was pulling the purse strings actually understood everything that it is that you're working on and, and how it all came together. What if he actually understood that? Life, <laughs> Life would be easy. That's exactly. What if uh, marketers, people like me, actually understood usability, right? What if people who were trying to sell very, you know, beautiful, flashy things 
actually understood that they weren't the most usable things, right? How great would that be? Um, what if developers understood, understood visitors, right? Um, and so I don't want to pick on any developers, but you know, what if you knew exactly who the, the person was that you were building for? We had some great discussions last night at dinner about usability, not just for the, the visitors coming to the site, but what about the site admins? What about usability when they're, when they're navigating through Drupal? What about creating custom uh, menus and stuff for them to be able to, to add, do all the admin features on the site? What if every developer understood that? What if designers understood business strategy? Right? Every CEO, how many business people in the room? They're just, yeah. What if, what if every designer you ran, ran into understood what your strategy was for your business? Right? How great would that be? And finally, and this is big for me, what if everybody understood metrics? What if we could all get into Google Analytics and be like, oh yeah, I can dig down and I can set up filters and I know exactly how well this one landing page on my site converts and I know that when people get to step three of my checkout process that I have a 70% abandonment rate. And so I don't need to worry about whether I have a duck or a pig on my front page. I need to worry about why people aren't getting from step three to step four, right? What if we all understood metrics better? So this, I see this as... Uh, ideal, right? This is utopian. This is kind of the fantasy world that, that I would like to live in um, from the SEO standpoint, but in reality, none of this is true, right? All these people have are somewhat to blame for the fact that sites convert poorly, right? It's not just the CEO's fault. It's not just the developer's fault. Um, there's probably some blame to go around to all those pieces, right? And so, so how do we fix that? Um, so let's talk about that. Let's go shopping for a second. Um, so I have, anybody have kids in the room? Kids? Yeah, a few. I've got four. Um, and, uh, and so diapers and beer. So for those of you that don't have kids, um, on Wednesdays and Fridays, uh, it's been shown that the amount of beer and diapers that are purchased in the same transaction actually spike. Right? They go up on Wednesdays and Fridays. So if you go to your local grocery store on a Wednesday and a Friday, you're actually kind of likely to see an end cap of diapers next to an end cap of beer, right? And that's not because uh, the guy at the grocery store was just kind of like, uh, what do I put by the diapers? Uh, let's just put some, some alcohol, right? Babies like beer. No, no, no. They, <clears throat> they do it on purpose because they know dads are going into stores to purchase diapers, right? Because their wives have sent them or because they know that they are going to need them. And when dads are in the store and they're thinking about changing diapers, it makes them want to drink. And so they buy <laughs> beer, right? And so instead of making them walk from one end of the grocery store to the other, they make it very easy, right? It's, it's very usable. It's usability, right? The, the same thing happens, uh, again, for those of us who have kids, or how many people were kids at one point in their life? Everybody? Okay. Still buddy? <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, like we take our kids to the store, and I'm sure I did this, and I remember Pac-Man cereal. I don't know if I remember Pac-Man cereal, but I loved the marshmallows in Pac-Man cereal, the ghosts. Um, but uh, uh, they would put the Pac-Man cereal right where I could reach it, right? I may be three feet tall, but I could reach the Pac-Man cereal. I couldn't reach the, you know, healthy, well, I don't know, when I was little, I'm not sure they had healthy cereal, but if they did, I couldn't reach it, or at least I didn't see it, right? And they do the same thing with my kids. They put the sugary stuff that my kids want at their level. Right? So that when my kids go to the grocery store, that's what they reach for. That's what they try and throw in the cart. As we're trying to put in the whole wheat Cheerios, they're putting in the Frosted Cheerios. Because the Frosted Cheerios are on the bottom, right? Um, so, and this is a fairly recent development, right? In the last probably 30 years, um, did the, the whole usability or shopping experience um, world kind of start taking off. Somebody realized at some point that things like uh, dog treats, and cereal and candy and, and all the kind of, that, that kids were making the buying decisions. And so why put it where kids can't see it? Put it right in front of them, right? We'll sell more that way. Well, when people started saying that, initially, it wasn't like every grocery store chain in the world just jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, that makes perfect sense, right? They were worried about other stuff. They were worried about getting product in the door and stocking shelves and uh, keeping uh, cashiers you know, at their station and scheduling employees and, um, and all the logistical things that go into running chains of supermarkets, they were not concerned with whether they had the right products at the right height on the shelves. Right? 
but it's the people making the products and the grocery stores learned more and more and realized the opportunity cost that they were they were missing out on um, they started doing stuff like putting diapers next to beer they started looking at metrics and making smart decisions about the people that they were trying to serve right and what did it do i mean it, it makes great analogies for us but it made their businesses much more successful right so let's um Let's take a look at conversion rate optimization because in, in, in a very large way, uh, shopping experience uh, in a grocery store, in a brick and mortar environment is the same thing that we're going after, right? We want that shopping experience to be not only be better, but we want more people to convert when they get to the site. So let's look at some stats real quick. Um, in 2001, the conversion rate was just under 1.5%, right? Average conversion rate over the entire internet, which is a very large place. Right. Um, that was the average. Does anybody, can anybody guess what it is, what it was in 2009? 1.9. Is that already up there? Who said 1.9? 1. 1. Oh. Well, y'all were close. It's actually 1.9. So it went up by about half a percent, right? Conversion rate average over the entire internet, right? The number of users also went up a whole lot from 2001 to 2009 on the internet. But <clears throat> not much, much has changed. Uh, as far as the way we're building sites, right? They may look better, and we go back and look at sites from 2000, we're like, oh my God, it was so awful. How could we have been doing that? But in reality, the sites that we're building in 2010, they may, they may look nicer than the sites we built in 2001, but they're not converting any better. They're not doing a better job of selling your products or conveying your message, right? And again, this is general. This is over across the entire internet. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the abandonment rate for shopping carts is almost 60%. So of all the people that come to your site and they find your products and they want your products, over half of them don't end up giving you their credit card. That's like me going and buying, having a case of beer and a bag of diapers and getting and get up and I get to the checkout line and she scans my, my beer and looks at me funny because I've got a 12 pack instead of a six pack and I pull my credit card out and I go, oh, you know what, I just, I don't want to be here anymore and turn around and walk off, right? You don't do that in the grocery store. And people shouldn't be doing that on your website, at least not at that rate, right? So there, there are some things that are wrong. The final thing is the average bounce rate is 50%, which means that half the people that come to your site will just leave immediately because either you did a poor job of, uh, of having the, the content that drove them to your site match the content that they landed on or the site that they landed on was just too confusing for them or whatever it might have been, half the people leave. Right? And in, from an SEO standpoint, this is critical because if I get you ranked number one in Google for a term, you only get 40% of that search traffic in the number one position. Right? So if, if there's a thousand total monthly searches for whatever term it is you're ranking number one for, you're only going to get about 40% of those clicks, which is you know about 400 clicks. And if half of those leave, then that's only 200 clicks, right? Oh, it's only 200 visitors that actually stay on your site out of a potential of 1,000, right? So you're, you're missing out on tons and tons of opportunity. So how does the, these CRO stats and what we talked about with the grocery stores kind of work together? And, um, and I think we've all, we've all seen this, right? How many people have iPhone 4s? A few, right? How many people have uh, 3Gs? I have a couple more. How many people have uh, how many people have the original iPhone, whatever it was, the E? Nobody anymore. How many people at one time had the original iPhone? One. Okay. <clears throat> well, the point is, right, in uh, uh, in technology, right, whether it's flat screen televisions or 3D, the new 3D televisions, which look ridiculous, um, or iPhones. There's a small percentage over there on the on the far end of that curve that jump out and they just go buy it. They jump on the bandwagon and they, they buy the latest and greatest. Why? Not because it's necessarily better, but because it's the latest and greatest. It's what's new, right? It's what everybody's talking about. And then you get the early adopters who are a little bit smarter, right? They may go after the Gen 2 stuff or wait for Apple to fix the whole uh, antenna issue uh, with the iPhone 4 or whatever it might be. Uh, but then they go out and they buy their, their uh, technology. And that, I think that's kind of, I like to think I play right there. And then you've got the early majority and the late majority and then the people who, you know, are still using Palm Pilots in 2010 um, over here in the, in the yellow. 
Um, but this curve, I think, is very accurate, uh, not only for technology, but also for conversions and usability, right? The knowledge that we have from a conversion standpoint and a usability standpoint is largely the same. Over the last 10 years, nobody's come out and had some breakthrough in usability and said, oh, look, things are, you know, people don't like, uh, you know, if you want people to call you, you should put your phone number on the website, right? We knew that in 2001, and we know that in 2010. What happens is there's a small percentage of us who are early adopters who will who stop focusing on the minutia of getting the site built or, or running the business and say, hey, big picture, I've got this website. How do I make it more profitable for me? Um, how can I do that? And they do that by making phone numbers large and making it easy for people to check out mm -hmm. and, and watching their metrics. But it's a very small percentage of people, right? And, and the same thing happened with grocery stores. A very small percentage of people started using those techniques like putting beer next to diapers, and they started making money at it. And then everybody else said, whoa, why are you doing so well? How are you making money? And they said, well, because I put beer next to diapers. And so everybody started doing it, and the adoption curve kind of went like that, right? <clears throat> so if you start now with conversions, we're still way over there in that kind of innovators, early adopters phase with, uh, I think, with usability and with, with conversion rate optimization as far as the Internet goes. And so if you start now, you're going to beat all your competition. As a developer or a designer or a themer, you're going to beat your competition to the punch. That's that's something that nobody else is doing. If you're a, if you're a company, if you're selling shoes, and you start focusing on usability, you're going to start beating everybody else who's selling shoes. Although Zappos does look at usability, so maybe you won't beat them. But the the guys who are out there doing this are beating their competitors right now in in every piece of the the web pie, right? Even from an SEO standpoint, the SEO companies that are not talking about conversions are falling by the wayside. Why? Because you can hire monkeys to do their work, right? So, what's the first step in being better about designing for conversions? I think the first step, we did some training yesterday, some SEO training. Um, how many people heard about the SEO training we did yesterday? A few, why didn't you sign up? There was only five people in training yesterday. Um, but anyway, so we, we did some training yesterday, and, and the question I got asked at the end of the training was, um, what is, what's the one thing I can do from this training that's going to benefit me? And my answer was, change the way you're thinking about your websites, right? Change the way you think about your projects. Um, so the first thing is websites are not uh, uh, static. Uh, rocks, right, that you build for somebody and it goes and it sits, it's like a paperweight on their desk, right? They're investments that should have a return on investment, right? Websites should be making your clients money. And if you're not thinking that way, then you should be. More importantly, if your clients, the people that are hiring you, are not thinking that way, then you need to change that. And if they won't change their mindset, then you need to walk away from the projects, right? That's a little extreme, but maybe you'll tweet about it. Um, also, the websites are not about you or what you like um, or what you think would be best. They're about your visitors and what they like and what they understand and what they think would be best and how they can most, you know, everybody's got a base of knowledge when they come to your website. You need to understand what your user's base of knowledge is, like wh where they're starting and what they, what knowledge that you need to give them in order to get them from point A to point B. And the smaller you can make that gap of knowledge that they have to cross or obtain, the better things are going to happen. But it's not about how much you know, right? It's about how much they know. Oh. This is one that I would love to see, even in-house. We talk about projects, right? What project are you working on today? What project's giving you the most trouble? I think we should all start calling them experiments, right? Because to me, project means it has a beginning, and it has an end. And with conversions, there is no beginning and end. It's ongoing. You have to always be making incremental changes. You don't have to make, well, I say incremental because you don't need to test or, or work on conversions for the entire site all at once because you will fail. You will fail because you probably don't have the resources to do it. You will also fail because it's not really best practices to do it that way. Um, and so just test one thing at a time, right? Ongoing experiment where you're testing one thing at a time, you're constantly improving, um, 
and incremental improvement is the, is the goal you should be trying to achieve. So when you start looking at, at conversions, I think you need to be in this mindset first, right? You need to, you need to kind of switch out of that. I'm going to build this website, and I'm going to do a few things that I think will make, be more user-friendly, um, like I'll copy Amazon's you know, add to cart button that's flat on one side and curved on the other. I'll copy that, and then I'm going to be done, because that's going to be, you know, they've got a usable site now. They've got a site that's going to convert amazing. Well, you may have done that one thing, but what about the 10 other things on the site that are preventing people from buying or calling or adding to a card or you know, whatever it might be? So it needs to be incremental and ongoing. Any questions so far? We're going to get interactive here in a second. Okay. So the basics of CRO. Um, you need visitors to come to relevant targeted pages, right? They can't click on a button that says golf clubs and come to a page about boxer shorts, right? There's a disconnect there. It's not relevant. It's not what they were searching for. Um, don't make people read through 500 words to read that one sentence that just really pops, right? Just give them the one sentence. People will leave your site if you don't. Um, it's got to be clear. A lot of these things, I'm, I'll just, you know what, I'm going to... Right? So this is what I call uh, real-life interaction translated into website interaction. Right? If I'm talking with you, I want to establish trust. Right? I want to make sure you trust me, otherwise you're not going to talk to me for very long, or we're not going to build a relationship there. Right? Um, if I give you a whole lot of stuff, start telling you stories that just don't matter, right? if I can't tie my beer and diaper story into the presentation, then you're going to stop listening to me. Right? You're, it's after lunch, you're going to fall asleep at your, at your chair. Um, all these things is, is kind of how I would communicate with you or how we try and communicate with each other in real life. We need to be doing the same things as we build our websites. We need to try and communicate with our visitors the same way we communicate with our friends and our family and our coworkers. Right? Um, and I think the biggest one is trust. Right? And why trust? Because telling somebody to trust you is not enough. Right? And trust goes a really long way. If you trust I know what I'm talking about, You'll listen to me ramble like for an extra five seconds than if you don't trust that I know what I'm talking about. You'll just turn around and leave. Can you go back to the previous slide for a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So trust because if nothing else, it buys you more time. But I think this is the key element, right? You have to establish trust with the visitors on the site. And how do we establish trust? I think the first thing is consistency, right? <clears throat> if I send you a newsletter that's got that picture up in the top left-hand corner, <clears throat> when you click on it, if you see a very similar picture, it's got the same cup of coffee, it's got kind of the same color scheme, um, that one's talking about Earth Day and organic coffee, and this is talking about organic coffee and Earth Day. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a very cohesive... A lot of cohesive communication, right? This works with this. They complement each other. You know that if, if I like coffee and if I want organic coffee and I click on that order now button and you show me organic coffee, I'm going to be much more likely to buy rather than you having the organic coffee maybe down below the fold and you expect me to scroll down. I'm not going to do that, right? I'm going to leave the page. So consistency, I think, is a, is a very important uh, trust factor. So you'll see the logos are the same. Cups of coffee. How do you destroy trust? Well, you have a disconnect. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this? These search results. There's got to be some Lakers fans in here. World champion Lakers fans. Right. I might add. So I was in. Uh, I was actually in Boston uh, the the night the Lakers won the championship, and I, I've been a Lakers fan for a long time. Even though I live in Texas, uh, the Spurs were horrible when I was growing up, and so I had to find somebody that was good. And, and so I jumped on the Lakers bandwagon a long time ago. But it was great. I was in Boston, and uh, I was at a bar, and everybody were Celtics fans, and the Lakers pulled it off, and it was just... I didn't, I didn't go too wild because I didn't want to get beat up in the parking lot. But, um, but it was great. And, and so I kind of was like, well, let me see what comes up. Uh, I'm going to look for Celtics stuff because... 
because I knew people would be out there being malicious. But I like, you know, let's see what Red Sox jersey returns, and it returns an ad for Lakers jerseys, right? Right after Lakers had beat Boston. So if I'm a Red Sox fan, one, I'm not going to buy a Lakers jersey. If I'm a Lakers fan, I'm not going to be searching for Red Sox jerseys. I can pretty much guarantee that. And sure enough, when I go to the page, they didn't just make a, a mix-up and, hey, we put the wrong key term in that ad. They actually linked it back to a page that's completely irrelevant, right? And this is an extreme example, but that completely destroys trust. That If I click on that, all it's going to do is cost this company more money. I'm not going to convert, right? Oh, well, I may have converted because I'm a Lakers fan, but... The normal, the normal user is not going to convert there, right? And if I'm a Boston fan, I may just get upset and start, you know, practicing some click fraud and just start clicking on their, on their link and sending it to all my friends and having them click on the link and costing whoever this is, Fan's Edge, a whole lot of money, right? So that destroys trust. Another way to build trust is give people a phone number. So here's a site. It's kind of a good site. You should check out every once in a while. It's got some good stuff. We put our phone number on the top. What happens when you call the phone number? This phone rings, right? If you want to try it, go ahead. I won't answer it while we're, while we're in the session. But when you call that number, there's a real person on the other end that picks up the phone and answers, right? That builds trust. Um, this is a client of ours, a uh, previous client of ours, who they sell real estate in Austin. And this is one of those where I wish the CEO understood usability and, and design and everything. Um, because his phone number is the biggest, the biggest font on his entire page is that phone number, right? And he was like, well, I want people to call me, but I want the phone number just to kind of be up and out of the way, right? I want it to, he really liked that picture. And we're like, no, 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 it needs to be big. It needs to be big. And so we went through about four iterations before um, he came back, he gave us the mock-up, and it was, it was actually a little bigger than this. It was kind of ridiculous. Um, but he launched it, he went with it, kind of in spite of himself, and what happened? His phone started ringing. It started ringing so much that he left the phone number. He made it a little bit smaller, but he left the phone number big, the biggest thing on his page, because it was converting. Right? He understood that oh, I might not like it, it may not look the best, but it helps my business. Right? It increases my bottom line exponentially. Yes? Did he have a previous site up where the phone number was not big? Yes. And he's been very, very low conversion? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Does this, are you only advocating the phone number or are you advocating exactly to call and things like that? I think it depends, right? Not everybody, like, I can put an 800 number up on my site and have it ring my cell phone because I'm not going to get 500 calls in a day. Right? Mm -hmm. If I was, then it would be a lot harder for that to happen. Well, no, we got um, a CSR center, but I'm just wondering, do you wield the technology that's available for all the political interaction and the, you know, that would be a great thing to test, right? Test one version of the page with the, the phone number up there. Test another version with the click to call, and see which one see which one gets you more calls. Because it may be that the people coming to your page aren't comfortable with the new technology, right? Or maybe that they're extremely comfortable with the new technology and they love it, and so the conversion rate skyrockets. You know, if we're going to explore that rabbit hole for just maybe one more second. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that new technology might mean you're going to reach Panama or Ukraine. This means you're going to reach somebody in Pennsylvania. Maybe that's the thing. Sure. Well, and that's his goal, right? He sells homes in Austin, Texas. He only wants to reach people in Austin, Texas. Or, you know, maybe people relocating. Well, an 800 number isn't good for somebody that's calling from Ukraine, but an Austin number would just see you connected to other sites that would be 800. Mm -hmm. Kind of depends on how you get to our site. It actually changes. But yes, we do have a 512 if you come directly to our site. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, yeah, you're exactly right. If you, if you want international calls, putting a, an American phone number up there is not going to help you out. Well, I was speaking to a different point, which is the perception with this is you're going to reach a live person who works here in this business mm -hmm. and is knowledgeable and will ask you a question. You're going to reach Bob, the business owner. In the other one, you might reach Rakesh, who is third party, third party, third party, and might right. not be as relevant. But if I'm calling HP, if I'm calling a, you know, if I know I'm calling into a call center, I don't expect to get the CEO of HP, sure. right? I, I know that what I'm going to get, I'm going to get a call center, but I don't want to have to, like, I know, maybe HP, I was on somebody, some big website like that, and to find the phone number was like, 
Yeah, I couldn't. Oh, it was AT and T's website. I was trying to cancel my home phone service, and I could not find the phone number on their website to save my life. Um, That's a different kind of thing. Well, yeah, but yeah, it was frustrating, right? It, I mean, they're a phone company. I should be able to easily call them, um, but it wasn't that easy. I gotta give you one comment about usability. I was on the UCI mm -hmm. interface to log on to the internet here. Yes. And there was a, a sentence that said, "If you're a visitor." Click on the visitor registration link. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a link, and there was no link of that nature on the page. <laughs> yeah, it was a little confusing. I don't work for UCI though. <laughs> Maybe they should hire us. Um, those are all great points, though. Um, so uh, I'm gonna one more second on that. It's not uh, so. I talk about testing and incremental te incrementally testing. We do a lot of this, right? And so we have suggestions for our clients when they come to us about ways they can improve their conversion rate. But for us, it's never about having the right answer, right? It's about settling the debates that we have amongst ourselves. I want a blue button. I want a black button. I want a click to call. I want a phone number. I want a, you know, whatever it is. Let's not have those debates. Let's figure out what our options are, what our viable options are, and let's test them, right? Let's run a thousand visitors through a landing page, 500 on one side and 500 on the other. And see which one, you know, performs better. Um, you don't have to have the right answer. You just have to be able to find it. Uh, credibility images, you know, Better Business Bureau and and uh, uh, SSL certificate pictures are, are good. It doesn't really matter. We found it doesn't really matter what SSL provider you use, as long as you're comfortable with them <laughs> um, and you you like using them. I guess uh, one is as good as the next from a, a picture standpoint. Um, like VeriSign doesn't convert better than whoever these guys are, Global Sign. Um, but those are important, especially if you have a, any kind of e-commerce or, or checkout deal. Uh, testimonials are huge, and I'm going to talk about Zappos here for a second. Um, I'm a big New Balance fan, uh, so these are kind of some, some cool shoes. But I like what New Balance does. Uh, this is um, important to me. I've got, uh, I wear 15 four E's, so I have a very fat foot, right? Um, and so not every shoe fits the same. And I like New Balance because they have different widths, uh, which is really nice. But one thing that New Balance, or excuse me, what Zappos does is uh, they give you a lot of information in their testimonials. They give you when it was when it was posted. Is this recent? Is it relevant? Um, where is the person from? That makes me feel good. I, that's just a personal thing. It makes me feel good. I don't know that it helps. It doesn't give me any more information. Like I'm not. You know, oh, they're from Brooklyn. I'm from Texas. I don't like them. Or you know, I'm not going to read their testimonial. But it. it it makes me feel good. I don't know why. I know where they are. It's more personal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, then instead of just a one to five star rating, they give me three one to five star ratings, um, which is kind of nice. They break it down because, you know, the comfort may be, you know, the style. They may have loved the style of the shoe when they got it in real life, but it was really uncomfortable. Um, and I'm not into that, so I, I would like to know that. So I think that's good. Um, but then this is what I really like, right? On shoe size, they say it felt a half size smaller than it actually was marked. I don't want a half size smaller, right? I have enough problem finding shoes. Um, I want a shoe that fits when I get it, right? Uh, the arch, excellent arch support, right? And they all say great arch support, which is good. Um, and then width, narrower than marked, right? And for me, that means I'm not buying that shoe, right? But I'm very thankful that Zappos told me that. And so instead of just leaving their website and trying to find somebody else, I'll stay and I'll try and find a shoe that says maybe wider than marked, right? Because that'd be something that I'd want. Um, but they do a really good job of building trust with their testimonials. It's not just a picture and a blurb, kind of a generic blurb, but they give you actual decision dec information that you can make decisions on, which I, I think is great. How many people had a really good lunch? Yeah. Yeah? I hadn't eaten cafeteria food in a long time. Uh, we're going to play a game. Uh, we're going to look at uh, LPO pre-flight. So we look at some things before we do landing page optimization. We ask ourselves some questions. Um, if it's a form, does it work? Uh, does it work, you know, if we have a lot of people coming to the site in IE6, does it work in IE6? Um, if not, you know, do we just not care? Um, if we get a spike in traffic, can the server handle it? Uh, this is the most important. Uh, we want lots of eyeballs. We want lots of people looking at the site. Not people that are involved in the project, not people from the client's office, not their relatives, right? Not the client's mom or wife or kids. We want strangers. We want the guy from the other end of the office who we see in the elevator every day but we don't ever talk to. 
because he doesn't know anything about our client or about what we do. Right? We want some random person off the street to look at the site because random people are the people that are coming to our site. Right? I don't know them, they don't know me, um, and they're going to be the ones that give you the best feedback. Uh, and we do something called, we play the se seven second game or the seven second rule, but we give them seven seconds and then we ask them a series of questions right, uh, about what they've seen. And so uh, we want to play, I want to play the seven second game. So I need, um, you won't need to write anything down. And everybody's taking furious notes, and I appreciate that. Uh, but I need everybody to stand up for a second. And I've got, uh, I do have a prize. It's a great book. So whoever wins the game gets the book. So we're going to kind of do a, a last, last person standing, last troopler standing. I'm going to show you a web page for seven seconds, and then I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you're going to have to be honest with how many you've answered right. Can everybody be honest? We're open source. We're always honest. Okay. Is everybody ready? All right. Everybody see? You good? You ready to answer the questions? So, question one. Don't answer these out loud. Just think about them in your head. Who's the company? If you need to take notes about what your answers were so you remember them, you can do that. What are they trying to sell? Which ones get free shipping? The questions get tougher, and you'll get less, less time as we go on. What's the main call to action? And what's a secondary call to action? Has everybody got their answers logged away in their head? OK. So answers. There's the page. Who is the, uh, what's the company? All right. If anybody got that one wrong, just go ahead and sit down. <laughs> just streamline this. What are they trying to sell? Yeah, iPads. iPads. What gets free shipping? Who didn't get that one? A lot of you didn't get that I one. still don't see it. Ah, you still don't see it. It's in red. Right Right? It's not great. No, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, so out of the, we had a small group, uh, five people I said yesterday, nobody in that, we played this game with this page, nobody in the group got free shipping. There was five of us, and they were all much closer to the screen than you were. Uh, which ones get free shipping? They all get free shipping. There's a little thing down there on the bottom. And then, what's the main call to action? Select, yeah, click on one of those, yeah. And then secondary calls to action? Call. Accessories. This is the iPad side. Okay, so out of, we had five questions. Um, if you only got uh, one right, sit down. No, stay standing up. It's after lunch. I'm going to keep your attention. If you only got one right, sit down. If you only got two right, sit down. Everybody in here got three or more? Yeah? Okay, stay standing up. Okay, ready? We're going to do the seven second game now. Or, I mean, the six second game, so this one's going a little bit faster. Everybody ready? Did I get that one? Who is the company? Well, don't, don't call them out. <laughs> it's after lunch. <laughs> what are they trying to sell? I'm going to ask you similar questions for each one of these. Don't, yeah, still keep these to yourself. Just in your head, be meditating on them. What's the average savings? What's the main call to action? And one other option. So who is the company? Allstate. Yes, Allstate. What are they trying to sell? What kind of insurance? Home? Life, maybe? Car? They don't ever say car insurance. They just say insurance, but they do say drivers. So I'm going to assume this page is about car insurance, but they don't ever tell me it's about car insurance. And this picture doesn't help me either, right? Because I've got a family that may be life insurance, it may be homeowners, that may not even be their house. It may be car, yeah? 
But they've got, it's a family of three. That does not look like a family car. It's kind of exciting. Anyways. So, what are they trying to sell? Um, what's the average savings? 348. What was the main call to action? Yeah. Start, get a quote. And then, secondary call to action? Phone number. Learn more. Great. So on this one, how many people, if you only got one right, sit down? If you only got two right, sit down. If you only got three right, sit down. All right. All right, we'll stop there. Okay. We have the five-second game. It'll go faster. Stand up. It's just this one and one more. We're almost done, I promise. Five-second game. <laughs> so who was the company? Same set, of, similar set of questions. Who was the company? What are they trying to sell? What was the offer, or what was a offer? That one looked a lot to me like a like a Sunday paper ad. Right? Somebody was just like, "Oh, just put that up, and this would make a great website." How much do you have to spend to get free shipping, and what's the call to action? <laughs> so, who's the company? AJ Madison. AJ Madison. AJ yeah, there you go. Uh, AJ Madison. Oh, what are they trying to sell? Appliances. Everything. <laughs> yes, appliances. What's the offer? Yeah. Spend more, save more, I think is the is what is what I notice, which is I always think is funny, but yeah. Percent. Yeah, percent. Five, ten, eight, fifteen hundred dollar tax rebate is kinda nice. What gets free shipping? To that yeah, spend to that. To me that seems like really important. If I'm buying something as a washing machine, I would really like to get free shipping on that. Right? I don't want to have to pay bulk rates. Yeah. <laughs> And what's the call to action? Just click here, shop now. Okay, uh, if you only got one, sit down. If you only got two, sit down. Okay, we'll, we'll, okay. everybody else hang in there. All right, four second game. <laughs> you ready for this one? Everybody holding on? No iPhones, don't take pictures. Did you get that? Similar group of questions. Who is the company? Don't shout it out. What are they trying to sell? What's the offer? What am I supposed to do? And finally, what's the call to action? Everybody still standing up? Good. Got your answers? Maybe. <laughs> so who's the company? Hmm. I don't know. Isn't it all first? And that's what's in the top left-hand corner where everybody else's logo was? No, it's Sprint. I'm just kidding. It is Sprint, but Sprint put their logo. On whoever built the site said, "Hey, let's put the logo in the middle." Even though everybody looks up in the top left-hand corner for the logo. Let's put ours in the middle. I don't know. Yeah. That's a great question. This whole diagram is all their things that they've done first with their door uh, What are they trying to sell? 4G phones. 4G phones, yeah. Service, phones. Evos. Evos. Do you love your Evo? I love mine. Yeah. Same here. It prints money and you can... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's the offer? Uh, get one, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but I didn't see one. Yeah. No offer. Yeah. What am I supposed to do? 
Share the page? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. So I don't know what Sprint wants me to do, but what I did was I clicked. And I like robots, so I clicked on the robot. And this is what I got. So without giving me much information and already kind of confusing me, Sprint pops up a screen and says, I would like to know what you look like. I'd also like to know where you are and your name and how I can contact you. But then I have more questions. So you have to hit next, right? I'm not a Sprint customer. Um, I've never been a Sprint customer. Uh, my mom told me not to talk to strangers. I'm not comfortable <laughs> giving somebody that information without knowing why. I still, at this point, don't know why, right? So I didn't click. Um, I closed that screen. I, I don't know. The answer is I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, what was the call to action? Well, yeah, find a store, contact us. Somebody said share. I want my up there, back. maybe. You want your four seconds <laughs> back? <laughs> yes, that's perfect. So, everybody, uh, if you only got one right, sit down. If you only got two right, sit down. If you only got three right, sit down. I don't think they have the ratings. Four? Three? Okay, well. So if you got if you were in that last group, I've got three books. I've got one here, and I've got two uh, back at the table. So just come see me. I totally lost track of what the five questions and what the answers were. Yeah, there's not any. So this one's kind of a everybody should be sitting down. Yeah, uh, but those of you who stood up till the end, I will reward you with the book. Um, I might have that. So it's Drupal Six for SEO by Velachi. Yeah. By, well, I'll say by Veloci, by Ben Finkley, CEO of Veloci. But yeah, so just come by and I'll give you the books. But yeah, so the point is, like, we can go by and we can flame Sprint and everybody else and we can laugh and say, oh, it was horrible and in four seconds I want my life back and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in reality, we do these same things, right? If you go to Veloci's site, I can give you a key example. If you go to Veloci's site, there it says uh, in, the, in the footer, you can click on podcasts. Or if you go up in the... Uh, one of the navigation bars at the top, you can get to our podcast page. Guess what? I haven't done a podcast, or Veloci hasn't done a podcast in a little over a year. Why do we have the link on the page, right? Why would I want to drive people to a page of podcasts that are really old? Right? It's not going to do me any good. People are going to be very disappointed. Um, so everybody, right? Even people who do conversions convert their own sites poorly at times. Um, we are working on some other stuff. I mean, no, we're testing one thing at a time, and we haven't gotten to the podcast thing. But we all do this kind of stuff. And, and people can be, just like uh, Sprint can be a, uh, uh, you know, we can flame them and, and make fun of them and be like, oh, my God, why did you do that? We can go look at other sites and say, hey, yeah, this was really bad. I need to not do these things. Am I doing any of these things? Or on the flip side, I really like this. If you go to Amazon's site, I need to add this to this thing, but I mentioned Amazon's button. If you go to Amazon's site and get to a product page, on the right-hand side, they have a button that says Add to Cart. Um, and it's, it's flat on one side. It's, you know, it's rounded corners, but it's flat on one side, and it's got a circle on the other. Right? It's, it's not symmetric, like every other button out on the Internet is. It's either a square, or it's an oval, or it's rounded in some way, but it's symmetric. Theirs is not. Why is it not? Because they had a debate, and they couldn't figure out which one was going to perform better. So they tried three things. They tried a square one, a round one, and one that was half square and half round. And guess which one converted best? The one that was asymmetric because everybody's eye was drawn to it. I know exactly where the Shop Now button is in Amazon, right? Um, Amazon's got the luxury of being able to conversion test stuff in like a day, though, because they get massive amounts of, of traffic. So they can get all those, those data points. But they do it, right? And they do it, and they completely dominate the space. Amazon's conversion rates are for an e-commerce site are, are ridiculous. Um, and the winner is everybody who was standing up at the start of that last one. Um, ABCD, the ABCDs of conversion rate optimization. Um, ABCDs always be collecting data. Uh, you want to collect data in, in different uh, areas of your business. So from a, a truly from a business standpoint, you want to be tracking revenue, transactions, uh, profit margin. Um, all the stuff I'm about to talk about, it'd be great if you could get that into one dashboard. 
however you get all your stuff to integrate, if you could bring it all together, you need to be looking at all this information together in order to make uh, good decisions. Uh, from your website, you can be looking at conversion rates, time on site, uh, what's the most popular content on your site, and how does that content perform? How can you get more value from that content? Uh, this is also where you would want to look at cart abandonment rates and bounce rates and all that kind of good stuff. Um, these are metrics that matter. Uh, and then you want to look at uh, user testing, satisfaction surveys. Um, anytime you're getting feedback, you want to correlate. Or you, if you're not getting feedback, you need to be asking for feedback. Um, but you want to see all this together so you can see how changes here and uh, on your website affect your bottom line, right? how it affects revenues and how it affects the number of transactions. Um, and look for leaks, right? Where are you weak at? After you see all this, where's, where's the most room for improvement uh, with the smallest amount of effort? It's very 80-20. What should you test? Everything. Test it all. You can test your secondary cost action at the bottom. You could try changing your free shipping button because nobody knows that you get free shipping on an iPad. Or, how about this? If they don't know they're getting free shipping, start charging them shipping. Don't just eat that cost, right? If, if nobody's buying an iPad because they're getting free shipping, if that's not a, a value-added benefit there, um, then stop offering it, right? Save the company money. How much does Apple spend on shipping? I don't know. Maybe not a lot because they do such volume, but still, they can either save money or make it more apparent and, and up their conversion rate. Sorry. Give me the one second on the last slide again. Yeah. Generally work at a good pace, but when there's many bullet points like this, it's hard to trust. Yes, I am recording. That's true. Yeah, should be up. Should you test everything? Um, so let's talk real quick about A/B testing. Um, so there's uh, one version of a website, and there's another version of a website, A and B, um, and if we take those two sites and we send a thousand visitors to them, whether it's organic search or paid search or whatever it is, uh, what we can do with A/B testing is we can send half our traffic to one page and half our or one version and half the traffic to the other version, right? And when people come to the site on version A, some of them are going to stay and they're going to buy, or in our case, they're going to call us or they're going to fill out a form. And, and on version B, the same thing's going to happen: some stay and buy, some of them leave, right? What we find out over time is that version A converts 2% of the time, and 98% of the people leave without doing anything. But version B converts 3% of the time, right? Wow, version B is better, right? It converts better. So that's great. So we run with version B. That's the one we start, we start showing to everybody who comes to the site. And although the conversion rate just went from 2% to 3%, we had a 50% improvement in the in leads and revenue and everything else. This is a huge effect to our bottom line, right? And I can, I can speak to that because my phone ring, rings more often, right? <laughs> I'm more busy because we went from 2% to 3%. Um, it's huge for your business and it's, it will be huge for yours. You can go from 2 to 2.1% and it could be big. Yes? It's a good question. Um, so we measure lots of things. That's a, so conversion can be many things, and you should look at the conversion rate of, of all those. It may be selling a book. It may be a phone call. It may be a form. It may be the sign up for a newsletter. It may be uh, fan us on Facebook. A conversion can be a lot of things. Um, you can split those out, right? You can say, did this page get us more book sales? Or more phone calls, and so if that page. Are consistent. All the calls to action are pretty much the same. It's just that you have the they are. biggest candy there, and here you have the guy behind the laptop. All these the EAs are the same. Right. No, it's true, but I mean, it's a good point. You know, we're in this scenario. And this was our. I mean, obviously, it's our site. We were we were tracking lead forms and phone calls. That's what's most important to us, right. and so that's what we're looking at. So not sales and books. Not sales and books. Yeah, but yeah. We're not trying to compete with Barnes and Noble. Um, Boy, putting a book on there, when you talk about increasing trust, that says we came up with this word trustworthy. I mean, as far as the rationale yeah. behind that. Yeah. yeah, we wrote the book on Drupal SEO. Exactly. Um, we're getting a little short on time here. I'm going to run through this real fast. Uh, Google Website Optimizer is a free tool that lets you do A B testing or multivariate testing. 
A-B testing is where you have two kind of completely different pages. Multivariate testing is when you test like, do I want a round button or a square button? It's one element on that page. Um, but you, uh, if you have a Gmail account, you can get this. You can use the same account you use for Google Analytics. Uh, there's also a module that integrates with Google Website Optimizer. Mostly what this module does is it allows you to pay, copy all the code that uh, Google gives you to test things, and you paste it over into, your, uh, into the module fields, and then, uh, and then you're done, right? You, you have to pick your, you know, you have to design your red button and your green button, or you have to come up with two different versions of text or headers or, or whatever it might be. Um, but the, the Drupal module basically just lets you copy and paste stuff over. Um, that's the functionality there, but it is nice. Um, there are some issues. Uh, if you want to talk more about this, we can we can do that after the session. Uh, there are some issues using Google Website Optimizer on the, on your homepage. There's some stuff you have to tweak in the theme um, in order to make that happen. Uh, but you should go use this. Te go test one thing on your website. Um, it'll show you anyway. So you, you know you could test text. You could te test uh, you know different navigation over on the left hand side if you wanted to. Um, title of your site, whatever. And you can have multiple multiple versions there. Um, real quick, some resources, some things I would tell you to go out and read or buy. Uh, web design for ROI. Uh, Lance Loveday, uh, the author of this book, he runs a company called Closed Loop Marketing out of San Francisco. All they do is conversion rate optimization. They build landing pages for for companies. That's what that's what they do. Um, this is a great book. A lot of the material that I've talked about today and that we use, we've stolen from these guys. Um, this is another really good one. Uh, Calls to action from the, the Eisenberg guys. You should go buy that one. We've stolen a lot of stuff from them as well. And then uh, usability. So this is another test that I, or a question I get is, you know, if we want to, we want to sit people down and we want to do usability testing for our for our products. Um, the the guys at uh, TechSmith they do um, Captasia Camtasia same same company um, they've got a product you can also get uh, have people do usability for you so if you don't want to sit people down in front of a computer you can pay you know as little probably as fifteen or twenty dollars a person uh, and a company will bring people in they, that's what they do they bring people in and they have them uh, do some stuff on your site, and it records the screen, and it records the audio. So they're talking while they're using the site. Usertesting.com. TechSmith.com. Usertesting.com. Yes. There are SaaS-based applications that are now. You just put a snippet of your code and get people in. Yep. Yeah. It's it's very the that's that's a great point. It's very easy to get people. There's a little cost, but it's, it can be very easy to get people to sit down and, and do usability testing. Um, you don't have to go recruit people and bring them in and you know, full with the whole two-way, one-way mirror thing, whatever. Um, so you should do that. Uh, questions? Okay, so the, yes? So when you said about the uh, multivariate or a web optimizer on the home page, mm -hmm. can you shed some more light on that topic of what is different about the home page than other pages? Um, no. <laughs> um, so it's uh, I've got like two minutes left it's a little bit more in depth for that but what would probably be best is for me to put you in touch with our guys who actually do that every day and they could explain the whole thing, thing a lot better They what they tell me is that when you do it on the home page you have to get into the theme layer and add some of that website optimizer code around the elements that you're trying to tweak that's what I know I can get you a more in depth answer do you have a quick um, soundbite on this pertaining specifically to continuity models? On what now? Continuity models, membership sites. Oh, membership sites. Is it pretty much the same, or, or does the game change any, any, any way because of it? No, I think it's the same. I mean, your your goal is different, right? And so you may go about things, and you're going to be thinking about different things along the way, but you still need to be, build trust. You know, if I'm going to sign up for a membership, you still need to build trust. Your sign-up process needs to be easy, um, you know, not and not cumbersome. I don't want to get hit with a bunch of emails just because I signed up. I mean, there's there's lots of things there that can be. It's, it's, the, it's the same process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very similar. All right. Thanks, guys and gals.